ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Cladicast episode 42, the UK Games Expo 2018 Preview Spectacular. Hey. <laughs> I like the special ones. I'm Steve Tudor. I'm in the red corner, and I'm Andy. <laughs> and I'm John Cage. Are you in the blue corner? Steve's clearly the announcer in the middle. There's a microphone hanging down from the ceiling. It's more sort of purple in here, really. Purple well, and pink. Do. Oh, pink. Very manly. That's very you. It, it, is, it is quite pink, actually. It is. Is that the, <laughs> is that the sunlight? Have you been redecorating the room as well? It's uh, it's a combination of the purple spots on the curtains Ooh. and the massive pink... Uh... Um, careful what you say here. <laughs> <laughs> the massive pink covering over my wife's wedding dress, I was about to say. Ah. <laughs> uh, you guys are filthy. What's wrong and with this... you? And this is the second take. <laughs> this, is hey, marginally... be, this is supposed to be the better one. It's marginally less filthy than the first one, so... Marginally. Before we get sidetracked down that same rabbit hole... <laughs> oh, it's UK Games Expo time. It is. I'm excited. Yeah, it's taken us a while to get to this point, because uh, only a week ago, we were all sat going, oh, it's a bit boring this year, isn't it, boys? And then we looked at what's on offer and went, Actually, yeah, there's quite a bit. Uh, it's really weird because, like, all the kind of official lists, and Tom Heath's done the list on Board Game Geek, and I was quite surprised how few games were appearing to begin with. Mm. And yeah, I did have this kind of, ooh, ooh, I've got nothing to feel excited about. But um, you're right, within the last week, we seem to have discovered about 300 games mm. that we didn't know about last week. 299 of them we'll be talking about tonight. So sit sit back, relax, get your cocoa. We'll be here a while. I mean, mentioning maybe. On your marks, get set. <laughs> it's like that song with the out with the uh, elements of the uh, the periodic table. We've got Nightmare Live and Life Form. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> I thought you were going to actually start reeling off chemicals, and I thought this is going to be worth a laugh. A software engineer on chemistry. <laughs> That's got some mileage. Hang on, why is software engineers particularly bad at chemistry? That seems a bit harsh. Not 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 just you. No, just you, John. Just you. As long as it's me that you've got a problem with, that's all right. Of course. The UK Games Expo is the 1st or 3rd of June. It's at the NEC in Birmingham, and it is bigger than ever, and that is not some kind of hyperbole on our part, a word which for years I thought was pronounced hyperbole. <laughs> that's a game, isn't it? Given your grammatic, given your uh, the command of the English language, Steve, that does not surprise me in the slightest. <laughs> <laughs> I am Welsh, it's kind of... <laughs> It's a fair point. It's not your first language, is it? I can't even. I can't speak Welsh either. So it's sort of half <laughs> shared first place. What's w- w- English? English <laughs> or Rexish? Rex. Well, yeah, it's Wrexham, isn't it? Yeah, it's like La. I thought that was Liverpool. We say that in no, Liverpool. No, La. Right, la. La's definitely a. Oh, it's definitely a Wrexham thing. Like right, La. That part. Like La. How was your car? Exactly. Oh, they do that in Liverpool as well. Yeah, it's well, it's it's Rex accent is like half of a puddle and half Welsh. It is. It's weird. It's a very weird accent. It's like Skem. It's like it's half Manchester and half Liverpool. It's a very strange accent, Skelmersdale. And it's the sort of place that once you're in, you can't get out. It's like Redditch. That's the same. Once you're in, there's no way out. It's like some kind Redditch of. Redditch is all right. I didn't. I didn't <laughs> well, you say that. It's impossible to leave. It's like some kind of weird oubliette. I know actual people who've left Redditch, who are regular functioning human beings, in fact. Just think about what you've just said there, John. They're from Redditch. You know yeah. them, and they're functioning yeah. human beings. No, I don't yeah. believe you. Rest, rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> are you suggesting Steve and I are, are well-adjusted individuals? I definitely don't believe you. It wasn't a rule that because you know me, you're well-adjusted. <laughs> I'm just saying that these particular individuals are... I think the rule is the other way around, isn't it? If we know, if someone knows you, they're probably not well adjusted. Exactly. Well, if I like them, there's a good chance. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, as I was saying, it is quite literally the biggest games expert ever because now it is owned across multiple halls. Wow. So this is the third year it's been in the NEC. The first year it was in like four fifths of what of the hall. Last year it filled one hall with another hall just for open uh, for the open gaming and the tournaments. This year the actual stands are in two separate halls. Good lord! 
It's like, like a funny extension. If you look at the um, any of the Expo maps on the UK Games Expo website, you can see there's this kind of hall, little corridor, second hall. Yeah, I haven't even looked at the map. That's how well prepared I am. That sounds pretty epic. It is pretty epic. Uh, and for that very reason, we can't possibly mention everyone in this podcast. Mm. So there's bound to be someone we've offended by not mentioning their game. Um, Doesn't usually stop us. If that's the case, we're very, very sorry. No doubt you will complain to us when you see us at the expo. Please yes. do. That's what we live for, complaints. Set, set us straight, and then in the in the follow-up one, we can actually talk about the games that we missed out on. Perfect. Yeah, Everyone exactly. wins. All you've got to do is catch us. Look for the blue T-shirts with the Polyhedron Collider logo and hashtag Ramshackle on the back. Oh, I've just looked at the map now. I like the, the, the idea that there's Toot Suite. That's quite funny. Very, very clever there. Uh, it says Piazza Suite. I thought that said Pizza Suite. I thought, an entire suite of pizza. That's amazing. And then I was disappointed when I could actually start reading. Oh, that's, oh. that's, that's less exciting. <laughs> oh, exactly. Oh. Two halls bleed now. So this time we'll be both physically and mentally drained. We were last time. Steve and I were wrecked for a week. I wasn't there. <laughs> I actually do remember last year's about uh, three o'clock Saturday afternoon. We just sat outside. We watched. We sat outside, got some food, and just watched all the cosplayers from the Comic Con, which was at the neighbouring hall. Mm. Well, I think most of them were the Comic Con cosplayers because there's a few Games Expo cosplayers as well. And I just think to myself, I am absolutely drained, and we're only halfway through the show. Yep. <clears throat> at least this time there'll be three of us. That's true, yeah. Share the workload. We, we did survive off a diet of Subway sandwiches and coffee last time. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Can't stand Subway. On the Sunday night, we both got back home. It like we'd, been, we'd been involved in the Battle of the Somme. It was just a nightmare. So actually, for those who are going to the Expo, a couple of tips. There is food there. It's expensive. So there's a couple of food places in the hall. There's some like uh, canteen me restaurant things at the back of the main exhibitor hall. There's some Subway sandwich places just outside. And then out by the lake last year, there were a couple of food trucks. And then at the hotel, which is a good 10 minutes walk to the um, Hilton Metropole, isn't it? Yes. It's, it's further than you think. Yeah, there's another like little street vendor place usually with loads of food there as well. Oh. But bear in mind, it ain't going to be cheap. No. Mm. Most importantly, though, there was an amazing coffee vendor. At least there has been for the last two times. This little sort Ooh, of yes, cart was, thing, yeah. and that was belting. Bloody expensive, and you got about two thimbles full of coffee, but it was necessary. Oh, but it was good coffee. Yeah, it was, it was strong coffee. stuff. It was nice and strong, which was just what we needed first oh. thing in the morning. Bing! And then ten minutes later, I've got the shakes, and I need some more. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So some of the things that are going on that we are hopefully going to be present at, Paul Grogan is doing a charity raffle again this year. We always like a good cause here at the PHC. So last year was the same time he did his infamous ice fishing tournament. That was an ordeal, that was. Not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel a bit sad that I missed that. It, 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 was, it was interesting. It was an experience. Yes. <laughs> so Paul will be selling tickets from the CG stand all week, uh, all weekend, sorry, and it's at the main stage in Hall 2 on Saturday night at 6pm. So we're definitely going to be there. That's the that's one place I think we know we're going to be and when. You say yeah. you will be. Yes. Me and Steve I, will be, yeah. I will not be, unfortunately, no. I'm going to have to excuse myself, take my leave, and uh, go and see Bill Bailey in the NIA. So the other arena in Birmingham, I'll be there watching high-end musical comedy. It's a good show. Yes. I've, mm. I've oh, seen yes, it, and I know it to be good. Excellent. But I blame my girlfriend for booking it in on this particular day, and she has not given me the Weasley allowance to get out of it. So, okay, fine. That will present some logistical challenges. Well, that will, actually, because NIA is not... is the other end of Birmingham as well, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Hmm. I've got to, I've got to walk to the train station to, to an international airport, get on the train, go to Birmingham New Street, and then find my way through Birmingham City Centre, the NIA. Be all right. Probably via a pub or two. I'll definitely be all right, then. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's fine. I'm, I'm sure I'll just take the edge off with uh, a few nice, calming beers. Half a dozen or so. Yeah, exactly. I'm not driving, so it's fine. 
Fair. So the other thing that's going on, which is worth mentioning, Paul Grogan is also doing a Gaming Rules Live podcast. So he's doing Gaming Rules Live with friends. That's on Friday night at nine o'clock in the um, in the seminar hall, which is where most of the seminars and live podcasts are being held. We... I can't promise anything, but we have tentatively been invited to come on for maybe a short period of that. But it might mean we've got to sit on Tom Heath's lap. I've sat on worse. Could be worse. You could be sitting on my lap. Well, yeah. I've promised I won't squirm too much as well. <laughs> Ew. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> oh, dear. So we've got a big list here of games that we're quite excited about. But we did promise ourselves that we'd only we'd only deal with three each. So instead of mentioning several hundred and putting you all to sleep, we thought we'd just give some honourable mentions to those that didn't quite make it for a full we're really excited about these ones. So so the first thing is that from last the last episode's podcast, we mentioned a card game that neither Steve or myself could remember the name of, and the name of it is The In Between, which was the Stranger, Stranger Things. things. Rip off kind of thing, not rip off. That's the wrong word. Uh, homage. Homage. We there we go. <laughs> uh, but the good news is it'll be at the expo, so you'll be able to have a look at that. That's one. Board and Dice are doing that, and Board and Dice are bringing a few games, a few couple of which I've actually managed to play. Mm-hmm. One of which actually arrived a prototype arrived this morning. So the new one they're bringing is called Five Minute Chase, and I've got the box. I've looked at the box, and gone. I don't have enough time to play this before we record the podcast, so <laughs> it looks interesting. And it seems to be like a quick rule about doing a chase across town. Um, the other one they've got, which I have played, is Blight Chronicles Agent Decker, which I did actually meant to mention on the last podcast, but didn't get round to. And that's a solo game. Oh, it's yes. a solo deck builder. Looks good, though. Now, do you remember uh, me talking about Super Hot last year? Yeah. Yes. It's based on the same system as Super Hot but with a lot more theme added onto it. Okay. So Super Hot was quite abstract. This has got more thematic elements, so you're, sneak- you're sneaking into somewhere to steal something, and so you're trying to avoid like security cameras, get through locked doors, that kind of thing. But what's interesting, it's got a storyline, and it's got a branching storyline. Cool. So as you play, as you do each mission, you'll get a branching option as to where to go to the next mission, and that will change what appears in the decks. Interesting. Really quite interesting. I really quite enjoyed it. So is this also a single player one or is it? Yes, this is another single player game, yeah. yeah. Cool. Very good. I have put in, obviously, something something that will always catch my eye is Nightmare Live. So not a game as such, but a live show. I've covered it before. I've been to the live show a couple of times outside of the expo. And for anyone who was alive in the 80s and 90s, they will know exactly what Nightmare is with Tree Guard and all that jazz. But uh, Paul and the crew are bringing Nightmare live to at least three, possibly more sessions, hour long each. I don't know what venue it's in, but presumably probably the the, uh, the conferencing suite somewhere where people go up, go up stick on the, uh, the helm of truth and are guided to their doom by three morons with a microphone. And it nice. is fabulous. It is so good. It's very, very funny. Everything's ad-libbed because nobody knows what's going to happen. Something will probably go wrong, and I can guarantee you Dragon will make you laugh. <laughs> I would definitely like to make it to that. You should. There are tickets left. I had a check this morning. I think there were 300 tickets per show, and there are still plenty left, so get involved. I don't know how much they are, but it doesn't matter because it's awesome and worth the money. We should coordinate and see if we can all three get to that one. We should. I was tempted to apply to be the guy with the helmet, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> but mm. I haven't yet. I might try. See if I can pull some strings. You're um, you're reasonably uh, familiar with the guys that run that, right? So, Well, you say familiar in the sense that I grabbed him after the first show, got my photo taken with him and put him on the website, yes. Yeah, there you go. That's as far as our familiarity goes. Maybe I should say uncomfortably familiar yes <laughs> it's the same kind of familiarity a stalker has with its victim yes pretty much, <laughs> yes i know you only through binoculars oh shit it's him <laughs> so there's a few games we want to mention that i said we didn't make a full list i want to quickly mention that Asmodee are going to be bringing Game of Thrones, the miniature game. Sorry, it's not called Game of Thrones, the miniature game, is it? It's called A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game. It is. Get it right, Tudor. Uh, You're showing And I want all. to put as an honourable mention, because I don't need any more miniatures games in my life. 
I've got a whole stack them. of unpainted. <laughs> I want it, yeah. So I really want. It's, it's apparently going to be available to try out. This is uh, Simon's uh, Kickstarter success from last year. My understanding is we'll be able to give it a go. I want to give it a go, and I almost want to not like it because if I like it, then I'll be going home with a boot full of unpainted plastic. <laughs> I'm okay with doing that. Maybe I can help you out, Steve. Awesome. <laughs> there you go. I promised myself I'm not going to buy any more games until I start playing the ones I've got, but I know I'm going to break my rule. Of course you are. You're rule. going to break it at UK Games Expo, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Ru- rules are like legs. They're made to be broken. <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was Arrakis uh, coming into life again. Shut up, back. Speaking of Arrakis, Uh-oh. this time last year... We weren't playing Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, since last year's Games Expo, I've had a Dungeons and Dragons group fall apart and then started another one where I've stupidly taken on two groups at the same time. So this time last year, we were kind of just ignoring all the RPG stuff, saying we don't play RPG, so we're not going to look at it. And since then, we've been playing RPGs every week. Oh, how we've yes. changed our tune. Um, you, so I've, I've been playing three RPGs a week. <laughs> So a couple of the things I wanted to mention is uh, one of the games you have been playing is the Star Trek Adventures RPG, isn't it, Andy? Yes, and it's brill, actually. It's very, very fun. Modifius's 2D20 system, there's this kind of a push your look element in the sense that if you get more successes than you need when you do a test, you can add what's called momentum, which you can spend later on for harder tests. You can also push your look and just do it anyway, but the, uh, the DM gets threat, which they can use against you. So we don't do that because our DM is a bit of a dick. And um... <laughs> as all the best DMs are. Exactly. <laughs> yes, they all are. And I speak as one of them. And yeah, the Modifius, if I understand rightly, have just released another book for it. Because I think Paul got one because he, he bought the sort of super duper Borg Cube version of this when it came out. And I think they've just released or recently released another book for it, which is either on its way or has arrived recently with a load of other stuff. So, yeah, I think I think the starter set's going to be available at the expo. I think. Okay. Uh, or if not, there'll be definitely some new stuff there. The other thing they're doing, and I don't know how much of this is going to be available at expo, but they they are own the rights now to Vampire the Masquerade. <gasps> mm. Yes. I don't know exactly. That, I don't know how much they've got, but I'm excited. That was the sound of something shameful running down my thigh. <laughs> Which, yeah. for Vampire the Masquerade, seems strangely appropriate. It really mm. does, because it was it was adult, to, shall we say, in pretty much every way. There yeah. were a lot, Especially playing Bloodlines, there was a lot of boobage on display in that game. A lot of cleavage that you could lose your dog in. But it was a bloody good game, so I'm very, very keen to play uh, Vampire Masquerade RPG. You should be more careful with your dogs. <laughs> the other game that uh, RPG is worth mentioning is Paizo will be there I assume it's pronounced Paizo and not Piazzo or something like that I'll be proven wrong no doubt it's not Piso, is it what those electronic components that goes beep uh, but they'll be bringing Starfinder again and they've also got the Pathfinder playtest because they are doing a second edition of Pathfinder ooh Mathfinder excellent mm. I've never played Pathfinder I'd be interested in, in trying Pathfinder because um, I listen to the Dragon's Horde quite a bit and although I don't really get on with their format change, they're, it's still fun. Bit of feedback there. And they're all, um, well, I've already given it to them. They've blatantly ignored <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've, they've got better, but one of them was the DM and the other one was like the player kind of going through this adventure whilst asking questions. And then they swapped over, except the one that used to be the DM can't let go of being the DM. <laughs> Ooh. So he's kind of yeah. describing the world and just sort of getting on with uh, DMing whilst being the player character, which I find irritating. <laughs> mm. Like, just be one or the other. Pick one. Don't mind which one you are. Meta, meta gaming. Yeah. I'm going to do an intelligence check and do, do this thing. Let the DM decide what you're going to do. You tell him what you want to try. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll tell you what you need to do. I must admit, that would wind me up. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, I'm like, I'm okay, I can let this go, I can let this go. And then they'll do something else. I'm like, no, no, this is really irritating. <laughs> so moving away from RPGs, while I was scanning through the list, I spotted a game called Lifeform, which looks quite intriguing. Unfortunately, it looks an awful lot like Nemesis that both Andy and I backed. Did you back we it all did. End, Andy? We all did. Yeah, we I all did. Well, well, I backed it for a pound, so I haven't decided whether I'm going to go in the pledge manager. You've just, yeah, you've just, you've just reminded me. I need to go into that pledge manager and... Maybe adjust things upwards. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. It looks like a very similar game from from what I've seen of it. Uh, just a, maybe slightly more complicated and less 
um, pretty artworky was the impression I got. Mm. It does look very, very similar board wise. It doesn't have the miniatures at the moment, whether it's going to have them or not. Yeah, similar idea where you're moving around a spaceship and something's something else is there, and it pops up and murders people. And yeah, what other honourable mentions have you guys got up your sleeves? Ice cool two. Hey. <laughs> so how's it different? It's got a two on the end. It's got a two. We'll find out at the expo. There's more All I know of is it. They're doing a, a second one, and apparently it joins up with the first one, so you can make a massive. Does it make it like multi-layered? That would be cool. Drill holes in it. Ooh. So you've got to flick your penguin from one level to another. If you make the board better, I might be better at that game because one of the problems I had was I kept flicking my penguins off the side. Raising. Uh, a couple of things we have played. We've played Vidoran Gardens. We have, or, yeah. Me and John have played Vidoran Gardens. That's going to be our uh, City of Games stand. We've played Farsight. We're going to bring crack games stand. Oh, yes, we have. Is that, is that the one with big <coughs> miniatures? Uh, big Stompy Robots. That's the badger. Which were hidden. Hidden Big Stompy Robots. You didn't know what they were until you, you got to them. Yeah, that was quite uh, good. Ah, yes, I remember. Yes. So that's, we, we, I think we all liked that one. One we played at Aircon, Pictomania from CGE. Mm-hmm. That was which good. Which Andy didn't like because his brain worked back to front to everyone else's. <laughs> yeah, see, I just operate on a higher level to you, you know, simpleton. Sure, if you like. You worked at some kind of different wavelength because when we showed like a picture of a door, you couldn't get it. But like the illustrating the concept of pain seemed to come to you straight away. Absolutely, so, yes, yes. Very Ooh. abstract mind. One of the other games we have played, and I think this is worth mentioning, is New Speak, which is by uh, ITB Games. Oh, yes, yes. They, they did um, Subterra. Yes. Now, this is a bizarre, bizarre one because we played this at City of Games. And we didn't, I don't think we've mentioned it on the podcast yet, have we? No. I think we might have done in the summary for the UK Games Expo. Ah, okay. This is a game a bit like Code Names and Spyfall kind of thing where you have to... You have to communicate with a team without another team working out what you're saying. So you, you, you split into spies and you split into like monitors. And the spies are trying to agree on a location, but are trying to do it surreptitiously using a set, a set number of code words they can use. And the people who are monitoring them have a list of all the different code words, but they don't know kind of which crypto key they're using. And it's a game which in concept sounds absolutely fascinating, but fell completely flat for us. Yeah. Yeah, we we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't get on with it. We every every time we it, fought, but... I know. Yes, we've got it. Team Spy. We know. Do you all understand? Yes, definitely. And then you turn it all over, and everyone has got a completely different answer. And I'm interested to know. I, I think the concept is quite interesting. So it'd be fascinating to know what other people go. It's so it's worth trying out. And I think if you are vaguely interested in this, go check this at the expo because one of the problems we had is we were learning from the rule, just reading the rule book. And I think you need someone to give you some examples of how the game works, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's entirely possible we were playing it wrong. <laughs> Rules-wise, we had it spot on, but I think there's concepts involved in this game which uh, cannot be just simply described in a rule book. Clearly, I need to do that based on my Pictomania experience. And uh, speaking again of City of Games, we played Defection at City of Games and we rather liked it. And when we went to Aircon a couple of months later, some of our... In, uh, suggestions to be taken on board which I was really impressed with Yeah. so Defection will be there at the expo again go check it out it's a kind of um, elite with a bit of resource management yeah it's good fun I'm not just saying that because I won <laughs> but well, mostly that is a large part <laughs> no you, you did seem to enjoy yourself John I remember that sitting there yeah. beaming the entire time and I got completely screwed by the dice every time why do you think I was smiling so much? Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> it's not because you're winning, it's just because Andy's losing. Yep. A couple of other games we have already played as well. Uh, Wreck and Ruin, which is the Mad Max-inspired, like, the trucks and vehicles battle game. Yes. Well, you two have played it. I would yeah, still I really think... like to play it. Well, I think here's your opportunity to play it, John. Yes. I think I should. Go and talk to Mark. He's a very nice man, and it is a I bloody good fun a... game. It's it's a fun game. Speaking of a game which is actually quite similar in feel and th- funness is Hard City. Mm-hmm. It's a game we played that mentioned in the last podcast. The Kickstarter for that one has been taken down because they had a bit of a rethink about what they wanted to do. So here's your opportunity to go play the game before the Kickstarter relaunches. Nice. Yes. 
And another game that me and Andy have played, which is also going to be on show, is a game called Microbrew. Mm. Yeah, that was... Which is a game we've not mentioned before. Yeah, it, was, it took us a while to get our heads around how that worked, actually, but it is literally just a small tin, so something the similar size of Mint works, if anyone's familiar with that. It's that sort of size of game, and you're running a brewery, and it's a worker placement game for two players. And a lot of work, worker placement games don't actually work with two players, but this one seemed to. It's done quite well, and it was quite a straightforward concept. You're running a brewery, you've got beers to order, there are different types of sort of ingredients that you put in. You've got to move these things around. You've got to call it this vat of ingredients almost. And there's like this almost like a sliding block puzzle that you move these things mm. around in. And you've got to get them in the right order. So when you fi- you filter out an entire column of these things, you-, you generate a beer essentially. And the quality of that beer is measured by the types of ingredients that are required on the card. If you get 100% match, then you do well. And the quality can degrade and you score accordingly. It's actually quite clever. Gesundheit. Is that a hiccup? Right. <laughs> or a I, was, I, I was a hiccup. I was just trying to. I said, hold it. <laughs> I'll just die. See, he's that excited about it. He just ran out of breath at the mm. end. Just went, went supersonic. Do you know if it's yeah. available to buy, Steve, or are we still in prototype stage? I don't know. I think so. I think it might be available to buy. Oh, that's cool. Unfortunately, I have to say pass at this point because I don't have the data in front of me. Okay, because I'm. Which is useful. Um, I'm tempted, because I can't imagine it's going to be more than about a tenner. Maybe 15 Oh, it's going to be a cheap game, isn't it? Yeah, I'm it's, very it's tempted. only little wooden tokens. Because the last couple of years, I haven't actually bought that much at uh, Expo. It's you and Amanda that have come home with bootfuls of games. This year, however, I may go hog wild. Last time, at like, was it, no, it was the year before, wasn't it? It was the year before, about half past three on the Sunday. You just went, right! <laughs> That's because I hadn't bought anything. And I ended up with Fury yeah. of, of Dracula. For forty pounds, and then on the way home, they put it out of print. Yes, yes, that was quite impressive timing. That was actually no, I lie. Last year, I did buy quite a lot of realistic miniature, uh, realistic uh, resources. About yes, six boxes of realistic resources. Yeah, nice. never mind. Bought a shitload last year too. Right, we'll, we'll carry on that fun train this year. Fallout miniatures game. I don't think oh, we've mentioned yes. that. Oh, yes, I'm hoping to see a bit more of that. I, again, I don't know exactly what Modiphius is bringing for that, but I've got something. Yeah, John, John's all over that. Oh, yeah. And uh, another one that I've had my eye on, and I finally got around to playing, is uh, Hannibal and Hamilcar from Phalanx. Now, they're going to be... They're bringing another game, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, to Expo, which they had there last year, but they've done a lot more development on. But Hannibal and Hamilcar is their more recent Kickstarter that's just kind of been sort of fulfilled recently. Steve and I played it last weekend and got pretty much every rule wrong, but still really enjoyed it. (laughs) (laughs) It was a learning experience, should we say. It most certainly was. But that's I really liked it. It's a two-player strategy game based on uh, the Romans and Hannibal, so elephants and stuff running around invading Rome. Bloody good game, extremely tactical, kind of like Risk on steroids. Very, very good and worth looking at. Nice. Mm. I read somewhere that the Gaslands creator is going to be there, whose name is, Ooh. edit this in later. <laughs> I can look it up <laughs> somewhere. I'm sure I read a note of it in the previous notes and stuff, but I can't find it. So, yeah, I'll just dig that out. Professionalism. Yeah, absolutely. We yeah. are so yeah. prepared. We did, what, two minutes of prep this evening, boys? Two minutes. No, 45 minutes this morning, I'll have you know. I was late true. for work because of it. <laughs> right then, so let's get on to the main event. What we've done is we've done our usual three-by-three three rule. So what we've done is we've picked three games each, which we are particularly excited for t- to play. Indeed. Which we are going to try and get ringside seats to get a go of. But as we'll discuss with one of them, we might not be able to do that. Um, <laughs> what, because we've got a restraining order against them or against uh, us well we've got several restraining orders haven't we we've picked three games each yes. that we are particularly excited about who wants to go first I don't even remember writing this list you know I, I'm, I swear to god you just chucked these three games in because you saw them on my major list on our website and went right Andy you're talking about them But you've written them but, down see, in I've, two separate places Andy I know. You wrote this down, Andy. I'm, I'm sure I did. I just don't remember doing it. I've been on autopilot for the last week. So that's been fun. I'm going to try and pronounce this and make a meal of it. Teotihuacan, City of Gods. I've probably got that wrong. So if there are any Aztecs in the audience, please write in and tell me how to pronounce it correctly. This is a, I suppose, spiritual successor 
to Tolkien by um, Czech Games Edition. Nice light game, then. Oh, yes. Well, Tolkien's not that heavy. That's not the way you described it last time. <laughs> Teotihuacan. Huacan. Teotihuacan. Yes. Teotihuacan um, is another... Just, just call it City of Gods. City of Gods. Yeah, we'll, we'll go Twati with that. Huacan. Just... It's like Twati something at Street yes. Fighter. It is! Yes. <laughs> it's the hurricane kick. Twati Hukan. <laughs> uh, City of Gods is uh, a worker placement game uh, in which you build pyramids. Um, so Aztecian sort of Incan pyramids uh, rather than um, Egyptian pyramids. Distinction there. In fact, if you build a physical one in the game, which looks amazing. So again, this is another sort of mechanical affair that affects the uh, the game as you go, which is great fun. It looks fabulous. Again, a bit like Tolkien, there's only a couple of chances during the game that players can score, so you need to sort of position yourself at the right point, so that'll form part of your strategy. When you say it looks fabulous, I'd say it looks devastatingly complicated. I believe that's what I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, that's exactly what I thought, John. Because I, I told Andy about this because I'd heard this game was coming out, and I, I I put it on like Andy's long list as like a little hint. Oh, you'll like look at this, mm. and I hadn't looked into it. I just seen the artwork, and the artwork for the box cover, of course, looks lovely. You know, a couple of Aztec blokes, bit of a pyramid in the background, and what like saw a picture of the board, and I went, "Oh my god!" Yes, <laughs> there are more boards than a school woodwork shop. It's brilliant. <laughs> So yes, you build a pyramid, there are loads of modular boards, you move around, and the mechanic of the game is either, um, again, a bit like Tolkien, where you get a choice of either putting stuff down or taking stuff off, but not both. You, in City of Gods, you get to either put your worker down and upgrade them, or you get a bonus without an upgrade. So you've got this sort of imposing choice, um, so lots of sensible decisions to be made, which I can imagine could be probably quite frustrating if you get the order wrong at one point in the game, like in Tolkien. Mm where all of a sudden you realise <laughs> three turns from the end that you're a turn behind where you need to be and you're putting down on the last turn instead of taking off, which is very inefficient. It's like any worker placement game then. You think, um, I need to do all this stuff, I need those resources, but, oh crap, the game's ending two turns before I need it to. I yes. won't fulfil my orders! Balls. Pretty much! <laughs> yes. So yes, it's... it's um, I, I, is it actually out at Expo? It's, it's going to be a demo expert. That's what I thought, yeah. So I, I shall be camping uh, around the stand there. I forget the name of the people. It, it's, it's on NSKN's stand. That's them, yeah. Given that I wrote the bloody article, you'd think I'd remember that, but I could never remember the, 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 uh, the name of the company. NSKN Games, yes. Uh, they are designed by Danielle Taschini. So, uh, yes, that looks ra- right up my, uh, my street, that does. Yes. <laughs> yes, it does, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Heavy, confusing. Hideously and complex. Tics- and, yes, exactly. Unnecessarily to- complex. It's not unnecessary. It, what it does is it prices dipshits out of the market. That's what it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Come on, save us, John. We'll sneak a bit lighter fare then. Right. At the other end of the spectrum, <laughs> <laughs> something that, funnily enough, caught my eye... <laughs> Is a game called Off the Rails, which is a strategic puzzle game for one to four players. And to be honest, I just quite like the artwork. There's lots of goblins racing uncontrollably through a mine on little mining carts, picking up as many jewels as possible before the earth beneath them collapses and they all die. That sounds definitely your kind of game. Yeah, so a bit of, bit of chaotic um, strategy, sending stuff around a little maze. It looks, it looks like fun. Loads and loads of bits in it. You get a lot of stuff in money, I think. So I'm quite excited to see what that's like to actually play. i got to admit, I got confused when I saw this in the list because I keep getting off the rails and awesome mixed up. I See, I thought that as well. I thought, hang on a minute, didn't this come out last year? But no, that was awesome. Interestingly, there's another game called Off the Rails with some of the tagline on the list, and it's like a really serious World War II game about running <laughs> running trains across like the landscape and trying not to get things blown up and stuff like that. It's like proper Hello. dark resource managing. <laughs> <Andy>. <gasps> I'll have to have a look at that. <laughs> Dry, long, complicated. Boring. Historically accurate. Yeah. Exactly. 
It's all over that stuff. So yeah, I'm quite excited to have a look at this. Uh, off the rails, not that one. <laughs> Again, a- another completely different to the fun cartoon goblin-y fun that John mentioned. I was drawn to the game I in- I'm interested in by the artwork, which have you remember? Have you seen um, the old Harry Howes and uh, got Wrath of the Titans? Vaguely. No. The old one, the old one from like the 70s or 80s. Well, in that, the Kraken gets released and it's this big, huge monster. And this thing on the front of this box looks like the Kraken from the old Ray Harryhausen film. Mm-hmm. And this game is called The Ever Rain. Sounds good. Sounds dark, miserable. Yep. I've seen some stuff about this and heard a bit about it. And I'm actually quite excited about this. The only reason it's not on my list is I knew it was going to be on Steve's. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah. Oh. As usual, I yep. come late to the party and I don't get the best choice. <laughs> it's right up my grim dark alley, this. Oh, good grief. I've just uh, looked at, look at the box art now. Oh, yes, I am uh, sporting a chubby. That looks lovely. <laughs> so I would describe from what I've seen of this is a little bit of uh, horrible Cthulhu possibly-esque monsters, a little bit of Pirates of the Caribbean zombies and... Seem- and um, uh, what's it called? Oh, what's the name of the ship from the second thing? Davy Jones's locker kind of crustacean and zombies. Oh, yes, yes. And a little bit of Age of Sail exploration. So what you're going to be doing out in this game is you're going to be going off, and I, I understand the game I think is cooperative, but I also think you've got um, joint missions you've got to do between you and there's some personal objectives. And you'll have a main board, which is modular and is going to be revealed randomly. Okay. which you'll have your little ship on there, your little sailing ship. But you're also going to have your sailing ship as a board in front of you. And you're going to have crew, which includes like the bog standard crew, like riggers, um, you know, someone on the wheel. But you're also going to have navigators, a ship's surgeon, ship's cook, ship's medic, and that kind of thing. So you're managing your crew actually in front of you, and you're managing what's happening on the ship, on, on, on the board. That sounds pretty cool. The more I hear about this game, the more excited it is. Now, of course, it is a miniatures company that are making this. Grimlord Games have done a couple of miniatures-based games in the past, so they've released a couple of things for some of the bad guys. Now, the fact that there are bad guy miniatures which aren't sea monsters suggests that at some point in the game you're going to get bored and then you have to fight off what's boarding you. Excellent. Which excites me even more. <laughs> so. You bastard, Steve. You bastard. I'm going to back this balls deep, aren't I? Yep. <laughs> it's got pretty miniatures and a bit of strategy. Of course you are. And pirates! Arr. And pirates! <laughs> Done. Take my money now. So, yes, I am very interested to see this. Uh, hopefully, we're going to try and get a game of this in over the weekend as well, because I, I, this, yeah, so this is top of my list, I think. Mm. This is my... Like, last year, we went and played the Batman miniatures game and, like, ran down the, <laughs> the corridor <laughs> yeah, for it. I think this being my, my running game. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that does sound good. Well, at the far, far, far other end of the spectrum, returning back to worker placement, surprise, um, <laughs> is the Chocolate Factory. And not a Willy Wonka in sight. Thank you, so pardon. this is from Bad Cat Games. No, Alley Cat Games. There's two, there's two types of cat in, in, our, in, our sort of, in our list here, and I need to not get them confused. So this is Alley Cat Games. And they are also responsible for Dice Hospital, which I'm sure people will be familiar with. That was on display last year at Expo, and it's probably on display again this year as well. So this is by Cesar and, and the crew at, uh, at Alley Cat Games. And Chocolate Factory is exactly that. You play the role of a chocolatier. Making chocolate uh, to order in a factory to, you know, time, cost, quality, and all that really exciting stuff that gets us worker placement people very excited. But the rub here, and the the thing that's basically just, you, you'll just go, yeah, I'm going to buy the game now, is they have a functional conveyor belt. <laughs> this does sound awesome. How good okay. is that? Just push so, chocolates along this conveyor. You're not going to play the game. You're just going to sit there pushing chocolate along a conveyor belt. And they have realistic-looking chocolates as well. Made of wood, admittedly, so you can't eat them. But if you combine this with the poison chocolate, how amazing would that be? I must admit, the combination does sound like an interesting venture. Mm. It's, it's bizarre, actually, because you've talked about the uh, Titty Hookin. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Titty Hookin. <laughs> titty Hookin. T- 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 oh, I can't. I, I didn't try and pronounce it earlier. Now I'm going to have to. Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan, which. 
was it's supposed to be like the spiritual successor to Sulkin, but doesn't ex- include the thing that makes Sulkin like really stand out, which is the moving gears. Mm. Yet Chocolate Factory, which thematically has absolutely bugger all to do or similar to Sulkin, has something similar. It has a moving conveyor belt, so it has that moving element. Yes. So I, I've got to admit, I've not paid much attention to this game because a lot of um, a lot of the games, Alley Cat games, are coming out with are quite small box games mm-hmm. over the next few weeks. They've announced a, a, quite a few little interesting ones, but I just kind of thought, well, I'll have a quick nose in one of there. I'll, you know, I wasn't particularly, you know looking forward to them that much i said that's not the wrong term looking forward wasn't particularly excited particularly grabbing my attention yeah. yeah but this as soon as you said there's this moving conveyor i thought "Ooh, hello because i bet you there's gonna be the opportunity to put things on that conveyor and move it so that everyone else's work gets moved along and you screw them over almost certainly at least that's what i'm hoping for okay now i'm interested <laughs> exactly oh here we go what's that screwing other people ding John's there. <laughs> so yes, I am rather interested in that, and I shall be making a beeline for Alley Cat, partially because I didn't get to play Dice Hospital last year because their stand was mobbed. So I suspect it's probably going to be equally mobbed this year. Possibly, well, partly, obviously for, for uh, Dice Hospital, but also, obviously, for, for a conveyor belt with chocolate on it. What more do you need? Nice. What more do you need? A good question indeed. What about a bit of evolution? Is this the, is this the most tenuous link possible no, it's not even it's not even that <laughs> just, what else it's do you need it's you... not even tenuous yeah. <laughs> it's an evolutionary leap john that's what it is yeah indeed so something else that caught my eye was adapt which sounds a lot like darwinning which steve mentioned on the previous podcast was that darwin's right? choice darwin's choice darwin's cho- oh there's another one then called darwinning Good lord. That makes it uh, sound like a whiskey. Okay, so well, it's a lot like, Sorry. It looks a lot like Darwin's choice in that you you start off with a base creature and then you upgrade it in inverted quotes. But this is more to do with sort of adding stuff to your fish uh rather than adding different bits of animals. Uh but I like the I like the concept of it of you start with a baseline creature and then you you know you add like a sore nose to it and a a poison sack or a, you know, defensive mechanisms and stuff you can attack other beasties with. Hopefully, the mechanics will be better, more entertaining, and better sort of rounded than the uh, the game that Steve talked about. Comes with loads of dice, and basically you've got to upgrade your fishy friends, keep them competitive while you do battle with the other master fish that are in the sea. I think it sounds like fun. It's like Soggy Highlander, as far as I can tell. There can be <laughs> only one. Soggy Highlander. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I think we saw this at last year's expo, didn't we, Andy? Adapt. If we did, I don't remember. I think I think it was there, but I think it was an early prototype. Okay. And I have a funny feeling we spoke to the developer and he asked us what kind of games we like. We told him. Well, I told him like I like, you know, grim dark miniature. <laughs> based adventure games and you told him how you like really deep heavy boring euro games and he probably went adapt probably too light for you two boys then <laughs> should have brought your yes, job with you probably <laughs> that's why we need you there john mm-hmm. that's why we missed you mm. we, we need the uh the lightweight uh fun games well, th- so. this this is what's, what's going to happen isn't it we're going to walk around the expo in it as a trio and there's going to be a game there that like something will come up and someone will try and grab our attention and we'll go oh that's not my kind of game and just grab the other person that's going to be there and just throw you know someone's going to go to john and go oh would you like to play a historically accurate euro game Four hundred thousand different resources to juggle <laughs> in a game that's can be played in 12 hours or more and john's just going to grab andy and go here you go that'll be me yeah <laughs> sign me up for that one sir I've got five hours to spend. (laughs) We'll see you tomorrow, Andy. Bye. See you next week. (laughs) Yes. I shall make short work of this, my good man. For the record, I do like a nice deep game. I just appreciate the shorter ones too. Right, you definitely need to play Ave Roma then. Oh, God. (laughs) I'm not not playing Ave Roma with John, and I'm not playing Hannibal (laughs) and Hamakar with John. What are you suggesting? 
Well, you said yourself in the previous episode that you need to get all the puzzle in your head, and you know, like you're a software engineer, so you have to get all the variables coded in and set. You know, that bit at the beginning where you said x equals this, z equals this. That won't work with these games because Ooh. by the time you've got everything set up, it'll be three o'clock in the morning. And my head will have there exploded. Is, I was going to say, there isn't <laughs> enough RAM in the human brain for that kind of complex calculation. <laughs> it's like when you load a really complicated game onto one of those uh, systems that used a tape to load it. You yes. could wait for a good hour and a half for it to load, and there's a reasonable chance that five minutes before the end, it'll just go, nope. nope. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> yes, exactly. That You will actually end up with a stack overflow. Yep. I'm going to show my age here, but I remember the year where years when you didn't get a game on a magazine. You used to get video game magazines, like computer, computer magazines. Mm-hmm. And you didn't get the game on a tape on the cover or a CD, a CD on the cover or a tape on the cover. It's type no, it in. You got the code yeah. and you had to type it out I yourself. I remember that. Yeah. I remember the days when we got like peak and poke game. You know, you're like, you basically had cheats for the games and you had to manually type them in before you ran the game. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, because you're you basically hacking. You're basically hacking the code, right? You? Yes. You're yes. basically going in and t- changing the variable for lives mm. from you know three to whatever you wanted it to. Yes, that was great. You know, you, you spent half an hour typing this bollocks in, and of course, we didn't have advanced term code editors back then. So if you made a mistake on one single line, you're like, oh, for sake, I to retype the whole thing out again, and then you suffer the tape oh, problem God. John just mentioned. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> Well, speaking of a uh, video game, which hopefully doesn't suffer from code issues, one game I'm fascinated to see. Now, this has come out on Kickstarter already, and I don't know when it's coming to backers, and I got to admit, I missed it first time round. But this is a game called Chronicles of Crime. Mm. So this is a detective-style game where I was quite impressed, actually. It's, you're basically a London copper in it. You know, rather than being like New York policemen, you're actually going to be a British policeman in, you know, in this one. What's all this then? Oh, God, I nearly, I nearly went into a really bad Cockney policeman accent then, and I, just, I, I stopped myself. I paused at just the right time. Yeah, what's your spot? Hello, hello, hello. Can't be any worse <laughs> than your usual accent, Steve. It's, it, it can't be any worse than your tavern wench. Oh, cripes, mister! I've heard he does an excellent tavern wench. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you knew it was the Tavern Wench speaking to you. You can clearly distinguish which character is which in that RPG session. Yes, we did. That's true. He should hear Goblin. Was... He's fluent in Goblin. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've, t- we've made him stage shot. He's got stage fright now. <laughs> It's quite... Cheap. Oh, God, I've gone completely off tangent here. It's quite weird when you're doing DMing um, that... In your head, you've got the accent, and you go, right, I'm going to do this accent, and you can distinguish this character. But because you're trying to improvise from the stupid questions your players are asking this character, the accent just goes out the window as your brain kind of goes, well, what did this character do with this kind of information? Indeed. Anyway, completely bypassing, going back to what we're saying, Chronicles of Crime is a crime-fighting game where you will have, like, a grisly murder to solve. Murder? Murder. Murder, murder, murder. murder. <laughs> But what's interesting about this game is it's an app-based game. So you're going to have an app which goes on your phone, Mm -hmm. and then you have a pair of goggles that go over the phone as well. Interesting. And these goggles and the phone allow you to investigate the crime scene or or interrogate the witnesses. Okay. And via that app, you can get information which will help you solve the crime. So if you've got little goggles, that like VR, essentially... Yeah, it is kind of a VR thing, but it's that like whole um, what's what's it called? Is it bif- It's not bifocal, but it, it's screen. two lenses. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's two lenses that split your screen, so it makes it three D as well. Yeah. So it's a little bit of VR. It sounds a lot like what Samsung and presumably Apple have probably done as well on the recent um, smartphones. Because when I got my S7, and presumably it's capable in the S8 as well, you could actually run a split screen function. So you could run. You got like these. It was about eighty quid for um, this VR headset thing, and you put the phone in and a little sort of charging socket in the side um, that, mm. that connected to the glasses. And, of course, yeah, there were, there were two lenses basically in front of your eyes. It was quite good fun. I mean, so you could move your head around, and, you, you know, if you're on top of a skyscraper, you sort of look down and see the floor and all this sort of jazz. So I guess it's probably along those sorts of lines. Although, knowing the price of that VR headset at £80 might give you an, give you an idea of how much this thing might cost. No, it's, it's a lot lower cost than that, because oh, it really good. is just a pet. It's, 
It's like a clip-on. I've got a picture of it here. Yeah, it's like yeah. a clip-on thing that goes on there. And to give you a random example, there's a Tool album where the CD cover has got this uh, 3D effect. It's got two lenses in the CD cover. And it looks like that kind of complexity. So it's just... You, you don't you just clip the lenses on top of your phone. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's all you right. don't have to put in VR, and then you actually move the phone around to scan the room. Ah. I think there are also options where you don't have to use the phone if that's the sort of thing that makes you feel sick. Because <laughs> <laughs> VR is not for everyone, I've determined, and there are different levels of how okay it is for everyone as well. <laughs> I really want to get um, um, an Oculus Rift actually now. Mm. Now I've played on your PS4. Um, 3D VR affair that makes you barf. Um, I quite enjoyed it, but uh, the problem is I'd probably never use it. It'd just be like one of those things I'd sit glued to for a week and then yep. go, yeah, bored now. That's my experience. Uh, These ones make me sick. Those ones are fun, but I've done them all. <laughs> pretty much. So what exactly does this make makes this a board game then, Steve? Because all it sounds like at the moment is this this is a computer game. It's a bit like what Mansions of Madness is. It's the two things combined. Yeah. So I mean the argument with Mansions of Madness is you could play it without actually with the without the board. But in reality, we know we would never play it without the board. You know, you, there's enough going on with cards and dice and such like to keep you Damn interested right. in it. It's that it's that kind of balance between the two. You need to justify so the evidence, painting these miniatures as well. You will play with them. The VR aspect is just the crime scene and interrogation aspect. You still need to collect tokens and cards to represent these things. Okay. So is it more more like alchemists then, in a way? That I think so, yeah, from okay. what I understand of it, yeah. So, yeah, alchemist is just one part of it. So you're only using this to to get that one piece of information, but you need to be able to have gone to that place to get there, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's a bit gimmicky. I'm not going to lie, but I definitely want to try it out. If you can get a spot, the problem the is I may not be able to try it out because <laughs> I I looked at this today on Board Game Geek and they had sign-ins to play this at the expo and it's already booked up on the official playthrough. So it's three days they're going to be demoing this and all slots are already full. But I've been told by the designers, which the publishers, sorry that they are going to be doing um, a come Lucky Lucky Duck Games is the name of the company. I've been told they're going to do an extra session there, an extra game running, which is just going to be first come, first served. Get your running shoes on then. Yeah, it sounds like they're actually playing the full game at the Expo, so it's not going to be like a shortened demo. It sounds like they're doing the entire experience. Interesting. Ooh, okay. I'm not oh. that fussed by this one. I am um, having done enough VR stuff now like I think that with the board game I just can't see how it would how it would work like I get Mansions of Madness where you've got some extra bits and pieces and it has some ambience but the idea of then looking at a screen through some goggles and having to look around I don't know that seems like a bit of a turn off to me flicking back from okay. the goggles to the game back to the goggles back to the board it could be I suppose a little disorienting well not just that but also VRs are very immersive kind of experience you're there in the thing mm. but if you're in the thing like you want to just be in in the thing is my thinking you don't want to then be flicking back to looking at the board and going round. <laughs> you don't, don't want to be taking a red pill then a blue pill then a red pill then a blue pill yeah i don't know it just seems i'm not sure whether it would gel well is my impression well we shall find out indeed mm. maybe <laughs> Speaking of app-driven games, mm. see, there was a smooth segue. Um, Lucky. I shall be probably spending some more time, in fact, almost certainly spending some more time, playing a highly historically accurate, very detailed... <laughs> I thought you hated um, those, Andy. <laughs> no, usually I don't go for them. You're right, you know, because they just take too much time and people consider them boring. <laughs> but I shall be talking to Yarrow and the people at Phalanx, about Uboot of the board game. Uh, they were there last year demoing this sort of early prototype, but you essentially play as the captain of a German U boat in the war. Don't talk about the war. And, well, do um, talk about the war because we want to know about the board game, yeah? Yeah. 
that's a school. Sven's going to have another go at us, isn't he? I get that right. That's the only reason we do it. <laughs> <laughs> mm, what's that? That's a hook in his cheek, just there. Anyway, so you 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 basically play as the captain of this this tin can, commanding the crew. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a cooperative game. It's driven by an app, and the app controls essentially where you are in the ocean, how fast you're going, and you kind of tell it these bits, and it sort of controls what's around you and where you're going and various events that can happen through the game. And your your job as captain is basically to deal with all of this in real time, and that's the rub, is that this is a real-time game. Mm-hmm. So the app will give you like five minutes to solve a problem or whatever it is, or assign your, your, your characters to do certain things. I can't. I don't think there's any dice in it. I can't remember. Uh, but you move, and there's um, the submarine is actually a three-dimensional cardboard model of the sub. So you're moving your characters around this little mo- um, model. You've got very tiny miniatures that put in there, and the idea is that you so you go on presumably scenarios. I don't know exactly, but I guess the the idea is that you you, you run scenarios. The app will run a scenario for you. you I was, I was given the impression it was like mission based, yeah. so you'd have a particular yeah, yeah exactly. I got to say the um, the little model boat and the little miniatures does look very cool. <laughs> it really does. And in uncharacteristically, I uh, went all in on this Kickstarter. Really, again, which, that is which very may unlike surprise you. you. I know. So I know. You're, you're usually so frugal and so risk averse, Andrew. Yeah. Indeed, absolutely. Yes, it's it's just the reflection of my faith in the company. That's all. Um, <laughs> there's even actually they've released loads of extra miniatures and they've called it submarine furniture. Now, it isn't actually like a chaise lounge or anything like that. It's things like missile tubes and and uh, a periscope <laughs> and stuff that you can put in just to, to pimp it up even further. Uh, mm. But you know, the idea is that you run, you basically run two shifts of crew, but you only get a certain amount of basically stress. So you can only you can't stress your crew too much, otherwise they basically form a union and rebel. Um, <laughs> And uh, there's a shift change and wounds and things like that. So if somebody gets electrocuted or they get burned in a fire or something, you know, if a missile goes off badly, those wounds persist, and you've got to you've got badly. to deal with that in the next shift. Because <laughs> normally missiles go off so you know so nicely. <laughs> surely well, there's only one inside way a missile, the sub, not outside. Yeah, I was going to say if a missile goes off badly, surely that's game over right there. <laughs> Bang. Um, so oh yes, I, I played this last year um, for about an hour or so. I got taken through. Uh, when I played it, the app wasn't in the state where it could actually handle combat. I'd like to think 12 months down the line, it can. So I'm very, very interested to see this. But it got a lot of attention last year. Again, it's one of these games, as you just said, John, that really stands out because you've got this 3D model. You're moving things around. So it got mm-hmm. a lot of interest. I'm already all over it because I like what Phalanx do. Yarrow and the team there are incredibly fastidious about historical accuracy, as we've learned with Hannibal. So this one is also... And the best bit about this is, and this is this is my nerd coming out now, really coming out, is that in order to plot a course to, te- to work out which way your, na- your navigator's going, you actually have a protractor and set of compasses and a pencil to work out <laughs> what bearing that your, your sub needs to go. How You actually have to do GCSE maths to play I can't game. help feeling that someone is going to ruin their iPads with this game. It's an app-driven game, and you get a compass. <laughs> you, you, you don't use the compass on the on the on the. That's just silly. we we know. Well, that, maybe it's maybe maybe it's after two bottles of wine you probably get it wrong. <laughs> if if the game comes with some missing dice faces, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that was ace. It does look like fun. I'm interested. Wasn't there some kind of ridiculous level of um, historical accuracy and mechanical accuracy as well? So if you didn't like bring all the crew to the back of the boat before you fire the torpedoes, it pops up the water like a cork or something daft like that. Yes. The arrow was thinking about putting that because, yeah, one of the uh, the problems with the U-boats is that they were quite nose-heavy. So when they fired a missile, of course, the recoil, the submarine just popped out of the water if, if everyone didn't <laughs> sit at the back. <laughs> Move all the fat people to the back! It's okay, we're firing a missile! George, we're looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I'm rather looking forward to that. I say I've uh, fully backed it on Kickstarter, so obviously there was a vested interest on my part anyway. But I am curious to see uh, what uh, Phalanx are doing with this and how far they've got. Hmm. Hmm. So, Mister Cage, please rescue us from the drudgeries of historical accurate games. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I might have, I might have a historically accurate game. You know, something long and dry and boring. <laughs> I don't. 
<laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> so the third one that caught my eye is, uh, is a game called Heroes of Tenafir. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. Is it Welsh? Mm. It looks like it should be Welsh. It, it looks like it should be, yeah. It could be. Spelling to t- Tenafir. Yeah, it could be, but I'm pretty sure it's not. This is from... Uh, it could be Heroes of Wrexham or Swansea. No. <laughs> this is from Broken <laughs> Mill. Basically, it's a co-op deck builder. So not having enough co-op fancy board games that I haven't played. I thought I'd add one more to my list. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, you you start off with a sort of reasonably base level hero type person. You've got to hunt through some of the dungeons nearby for loot and upgrades for your character. And obviously, you're working cooperatively, so it's not, not too competitive and nasty. And every time you go out to the dungeons and you come back, some time passes. And each time you each time time passes, you get a little bit closer to something really big, big, bad and evil coming back and being quite nasty to you. So basically, when this boss pops up, you've then all got to collectively fight him and defeat him. And if you defeat him, everybody wins. Hurrah! And if you don't defeat him, everybody loses. <laughs> it sounded like um quite an interesting little game. Combat's quite simple, but it's combined with a bit of a push your luck element. So there's you can push things a bit further and try and get better rewards, but you've got to weigh that up with how screwed you're gonna get if it doesn't work out. <laughs> so you are you each running your own deck then on this, or is it uh some kind of like shared deck or something like that? Yeah, I think you've got your own your own ones, but your your deck represents your hero's health. So when you run out of cards. Your hero becomes exhausted and has to return to the village. Sounds remarkably similar to Conan. Sounds remarkably similar to Pathfinder, actually. Mm. The card game. Ooh. Uh, although it doesn't look like Pathfinder, I must admit. Now, I actually quite like Pathfinder, the card game. I know it has its detractors, but I'm a big fan of that. So I will be intrigued to try this one out as well, Mr. Cage. Yeah, I thought it looked like uh, good fun. And I, I need more co-op games because that's how I get my wife to play board games for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> which means that's that how I'm i more... get my wife to play board games without having an awful row yeah and <laughs> at any chance that cows can play as well means that i'm more likely to get a board game to the table which means i'm more likely to play board games hurrah <laughs> <laughs> everyone my, wins my, my better half takes great delight in beating me so cooperative games whilst fun and you know do build the relationship um she does take some great satisfaction in thrashing me which she does is remarkably often, actually, rather disappointingly. The, <laughs> the game back to the board takes game. Great satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Quiet, you. Uh, are we on the last game, chaps? Number nine. We are, but I have a couple more that I've forgotten to mention. Okay, well, we'll do a quick roundup at the end then. Well, the last game I want to mention in detail is a game which will be for sale at the UK Games Expo for a limited stock. And this is the game Century Eastern Wonder. Now, you may Stop recognize that, the name because this time <laughs> last year, this time last year, we were introduced to Century Spice Road. Three times. <laughs> which is a game all, times. all three of us. Yeah. <laughs> like I say, it's a game all three of us own, and John owns twice. No, I owned it three times. <laughs> Good three grief. Times. <laughs> So Century Spice Road, we all looked, it's, it loved, it's a game where you, um, little, like a little mini deck builder, but the decks of cards allow you to buy and upgrade your collection of spices, which you'll then use to fulfil orders which are in the middle of the board. It's one of those games that was like ridiculously simple to get your head round, but I played about three quarters of an hour. Mm-hmm. If that. But we all thoroughly enjoyed it because it was like a good Jeff. You made a little engine for yourself. Your deck of cards like built your engine, and your engine paid dividends while you're doing it. So it it really did balance that kind of heavy Euro engine build that Andy loves with the kind of quick play with everyone that John loves. So it, it really was our kind of ideal game. Really, and it had it? bling. Everyone's a winner. Oh, it had bling. Yeah. It was a good balance. Definitely, yeah, it was. Really, so, really good. Century Eastern Wonder, however, is a kind of a sequel. So, they always said it was going to be a trilogy of games, mm-hmm. and Century Eastern Wonder is the middle game in that selection. So, this one is this is the dirty middle child, <laughs> <laughs> Cornetto. <laughs> So this, whereas the other one was talking was about the Spice Road to India, this is talking about the, the road to the East and silks and such like. 
high seas. We're on the, on the ocean. Seas, We're yes. on the ocean, yes. You take to the high seas to go for sort of more expensive things. So yes, like silk and more expensive spices and more exotic bits and bobs like that. So they've kind of taken the concept and expended it, expanded it. it the game actually looks really interesting because it actually doesn't look anything like what Spice Road did. It's actually got a board this has, and it's got this little modular thing, modular board where things happen in it. So I've got to admit, I've got no idea how, how this game plays at the moment, but if it's that same level and balance of things happening, and it's got little spices as well, which is little cups, then I'm interested. But what I'm really intrigued about about this game is, as I said, there are three games planned. And the idea is you'll be able to mix and match those games into bigger and more complicated games. Interesting. Now, this is cool. So you can play Spice Road on its own. You can play Eastern Wonder on its own. You can play a game which combines both Eastern Wonder and Spice Road. By their powers combined, they are sand to sea. That's what it's called. Ooh. Yes. Mm. So presumably you load a camel up with spices and then drive it into the ocean, go and sell it and buy silk and come back. I don't know. Total guess, but that's maybe what happens. Surely you need boats. I mean, the camels have got humps to keep their spices out of the water, but boats <laughs> would be Camels are great swimmers. Yeah. Yes. I don't know, actually. Are they? Well, I wouldn't have thought camels are particularly great swimmers, given that, you know, water is not exactly their natural habitat. They might be able to swim, but... Their knees go backwards, don't they? They go the wrong way. There's, there's John's fun fact for the night. There you go. So, <laughs> just logically, it doesn't seem like they'd be good swimmers somehow. Because <laughs> their knees go backwards. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> so think about the way you swim, right? <laughs> when you bend your knees and kick your legs, it gives you it pushes your body upwards. If you're a camel and your knees bend the other way, it's gonna push your head first in. <laughs> he has a point. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Have we gone um, off topic? Whoops. <laughs> off topic, I think yeah, we've uh... The topic is a faint dot in the background. So yes, I am... Um... Very excited to play this. I thoroughly loved Spice Road, so I think this is going to be, if I can get one of these limited availability copies, I'll be right on top of this, I think. I should be making a beeline for that. It sounds like fun. Definitely. Yeah, nine o'clock Friday morning. This game is going to be about boats. We're going to have to ask them now, can they put in swimming camels in the next version? Totally. Absolutely, yeah. And to be historically accurate, <laughs> can camels swim without drowning? <laughs> <laughs> All we need to do is combine that that with Darwin's choice and you could make a swimming camel. Yes, maybe that's the third yeah. game. Yes. <laughs> if the camel spits out the spices it's carrying, does it pop out of the water like a cork? <laughs> I like where you're going with this. This is yeah. good. Maybe if they swam backwards, it would work the same way. That's probably it. <laughs> well, that's why, they be, that's why they need to go backwards. They can swim both ways. There we go. <laughs> And if they got lost, they'd end up in Central America and a pyramid. See, this is going silly now. You might say it's going off the rails. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> good grief. Oh, dear. That was a good one. So that's our nine main games we're interested in that got us most excited. But you said you wanted to mention a couple more, Andy. I did. I forgot two fairly major things that uh, we, we should probably mention. One of which is the expansion to Adrenaline. We've mentioned Mr. Mr. P. Grogan already. Uh, I'm sure he will be there. In fact, I know he'll be there demoing the Team Play DLC for Adrenaline, which is the add-on that we played last year at Aircon and all thought it was stodgier than a Christmas pudding. But he assures me that it has been streamlined after our feedback. So I'm actually quite keen to see what that's like. So that adds a sixth player and a bunch of other mechanics and also sort of team deathmatch and all that sort of jazz. So I think the problem mm -hmm. with the, the 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 first prototype, and admittedly when he did introduce us to this prototype, it was literally hot off the press that morning. Yeah. So obviously they've had a year of development to... to I think to he, still had, he still had the paper cuts from where he cut out the prototype yes. bits. Yeah, it was that <laughs> new. So they've had a year of, of streamlining and uh, streamlining, not for goodness sake, streamlining. <laughs> there, well there, there. I've not even had a beer tonight. That's that's what that's that's probably the problem. That's the problem, yeah. Too sober. <laughs> yes. So I'm very keen to see that because I do like adrenaline, even though I don't actually get to play it that often. Um Laura doesn't like shooty bang fun games, whereas we do. 
<laughs> the so this that's one expansion and another expansion is obviously my my man crush Jamie Stegmaier is releasing a new expansion for Viticulture called Visit from the Rhine Valley. So it's a bunch of 80 new visitor cards which are used in place of the ones in the game so far. So it's a completely different set. And apparently they focus more on winemaking than they do on getting victory points. Interesting. So presumably, though, they're going to be introducing legendary German efficiency to the winemaking process. So we'll all end up selling Liebfrau milk and Black Tower and other high-quality wines. <laughs> I can almost hear him shouting at the mic, <laughs> shouting at the, uh, <laughs> the speakers. So yes, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, that is apparently released on the 1st of June. I guess almost almost know that board game extras are usually usually handle Jamie's stuff in the UK, so I guess they'll probably yeah. have a few copies on sale at their stand. Guess mm-hmm. who's going there first? The amount of places you're going first means that you'll be you'll have to like duplicate yourself and spread out. Just imagine if we had loads of clones of me, wouldn't the world be a better place? <laughs> I've just been a bit sick in my mouth. <laughs> what sort of dystopian thing are you trying to describe here, Andy? The perfect world. It's almost like Rimmer World from Red Dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, no. Now you've got it. <laughs> It's Andy, Andy, Andy Lewis. <laughs> Rimmer's mind out there. Expect sickness. <laughs> awesome. So, yes, they, they were the two I forgot, and they're, they're, they're fairly big, to be honest. And another honourable mention is Gladiatore's Blood for Ruses. Yeah, I so saw This that. is the other cat that I, uh, I almost mentioned earlier on. It is Bad Cat Games. I went through this last year again. There's a lot of things that have, you know, re- are reappearing now, 12 months later, but I guess that's the design process for you. The idea here is in Gladiatores, it's a, mostly a card game where you basically run a small group posse of gladiators and you compete them against the other players to gain favour and glory from the crowd because the crowd loved a bit of blood in the old Roman times. So if you win the fight, the crowd love you. But you get a chance as the person owning these gladiators to bet on the fight. And you can bet to rig it so you win money by throwing the fight. So if everyone starts doing this, you can pay your gladiator to take a dive, get a load of money to line your own pockets and win the game that way. So it does sound like a bit of fun. So screw screw your enemies over as well. I'm interested to see this one because I've got Spartacus, which is exactly the same game, effectively. It's, it's a gladiator score. You're fighting gladiators against each other and you can bet against people and throw the fight. And the problem with the Spartacus, in my opinion, is everything around the gladiatorial games works really fun and you can be an absolute dick in it and it works brilliantly. <laughs> until you actually get to the gladiator fights themselves and they're really dull. So I'm hoping this has got an interesting actual fight mechanic in there that holds it all together. It does seem, being central, that would be one of the things to get right. I honestly can't remember what the mechanic was. I remember it being quite straightforward. We'll find out soon enough. We will Mm. indeed, in about a week. Yeah. So then, folks, is there anything else we should mention before we sign off? I've just realised I've not mentioned inspiring games at all, so I haven't mentioned Lord the Horde. And if I didn't, I think uh, Kevin would probably hit me when he sees me. So there's a quick shout-out to them. Very good. Mike Hutchinson is apparently going to be there. And Mike Hutchinson is, in fact, the uh, author of Gaslands, which I am quite excited about. I need to get you guys to play it. Yeah, this is the one with the um the the horn, the, not the horn beef, for goodness sake. The Hot Wheels cars, isn't it? That's the one. Yeah. Yes. Really cheap. Oh, can, can you can you do it with Hornby trains? That'd be awesome. You could, yeah. <laughs> They'd have to go off the rails again. Yeah, no, it's funny when I did it. <sighs> I just God damn it. Peddling a tired joke. Right then, folks, it's time we let these good people go by good if you too have brains dribbling out of your ears, it's probably time to sign off. It's our standard state of affairs, isn't it? 
Right, we will be at the expo all three days, or four days, in fact, because we're going to be at the press preview on the on the day before. So we will be around. We will be wearing our polyhedron collider t-shirts, and we do not know if Andy will be wearing a hat or not. Mm. I will probably bring a hat. It might not be the same hat I've worn for the last few years, mostly because you two are dicks and don't like it and clearly have no taste in hats. So I'm going to change my hat. It's not that we don't like hats. We just don't like them on you, Andy. Well, apparently this other hat is particularly fetching, so... Is it a sombrero? Please it be a sombrero. It is not a sombrero. <laughs> is it the sensible sombrero? <laughs> <laughs> uh. We will be there all three days. Say hello to us. We haven't got really much planned as what we're doing as coverage, but I will have a microphone with me and cameras, so we'll probably do some videos and interviews. We'll say hello to people. So if you actually want to be on the podcast, come say hello, and we'll get the microphone out and get say a few words. Definitely. Mm, you get to be famous. We're going to call it the Chaos Cast, I think. Nice. That's a good idea. How's that different to any other one? Uh, we'll have other people interrupting me, not just you and Andy. <laughs> it's going to be an improvement then. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a nightmare to edit that one, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. In the meantime, you can find us on all the usual sources. Uh, if you'd like to give us a review on iTunes, we'd like to remind you that only the five-star button works. Yeah. Others are broken. Don't bother. And, of course, we'd appreciate a like and a share and what have you, just to share us with your friends. Well, share the podcast with our, with your friends. Don't share us with your friends. No, no, no. Well, well let's it, not write anything off, mm. let's be fair. And not just your friends, in fact. Share us with your enemies. Hmm. Actually, that's probably a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to chat, we are on Twitter, and the group Twitter account is at Polyhedron C. You can find it by searching for Polyhedron Collider. I am at Wahothamadenga, but again, it's probably easy just to search for Steve Tudor. I am at Sonic H with a zero. And I'm at John underscore Cage. We are, of course, available on Facebook under Polyhedron Collider and Board Game Geek Guild 2726. But for now, we shall see you at the Expo and you'll last hear us when we've had our exciting weekend at the Expo where we talk about all the games we've seen in the next episode. So it's going to be even longer and even more chaotic. It'll be like Aragorn reading War and Peace, won't it? So they'll they'll do Lord of the Rings, then they'll break for Aragorn to do War and Peace, and then they'll get back to Lord of the Rings. (laughs) (laughs) Is that Amazon's plan for the new series, is it? (laughs) Sneaky. (laughs) So, until next time... Chatty bye. Hurrah. Catch you later.